sometimes you uh, have thoughts, people have thoughts and they go, you know, I wonder what a, a professional counselor would say about this or about the situation that I'm facing in my life. Uh, here's an opportunity for you to post that and have a response for them, myself or Tish, uh, in, and just kind of talking around those issues. So the first question that we've got is one on anxiety. And so I'm going to tee it up for Tish because she's an anxiety treatment rock star. Uh, she's an anxiety rock star. I don't know if you want to be really good at anxiety. We're good at, at treating anxiety. So the question reads, yeah. uh, what are a few great ways to manage stress and anxiety from being cooped up during quarantine? I've had more anxiety recently than ha that has been trickier to manage. Do you have any tips? So, Tish, I'll punt uh -huh. it to you. What do you have to say? Okay, what a great question. I think that um, quarantine is especially challenging because it interrupts all of life's rhythms on self-care. And so kind of all the rhythms that you might have in connecting with friends or doing things that are fun, um, even exercise, even sleep patterns, parents' kids are home, you're trying to homeschool kids and work from home, and it's just really disruptive to life's rhythms. And, and so being able to be um, intentional about um, your self-care at this time and kind of be able to assess like what you need and finding creative solutions to be able to do that and for you to have a lot of permission that it is a very um, it's a big priority. Um, and so kind of if I would say there are like five um, areas of self-care um, and self-care is really important because we know that stress is the number one trigger for anxiety and self-care is the biggest way, the most accessible way to kind of take scoops out of our stress bucket. Um, and so one is sleep, getting enough sleep. Um, two is nutrition. And three is um, movement or exercise. Um, four is any novel activities. And so that just means being able to do something that you haven't done before, which is really, really difficult at this time, right? I can't say like, go to a restaurant you've never been to or go, you know, do something fun with friends that you haven't done. Um, and so some creativity around this of like going to a walking trail, you know, that you haven't been to, just getting out of the house, going on a drive, um, learning something new. Um, if you have the, you know, if you have the free time and then the fifth is connection with friends, um, connection with people that you feel supported by and that you love and that love you. And so those are kind of the five areas of, um, that promote neuroplasticity and that are really big in self-care. Um, and so I think the challenging thing right now is that all of those rhythms are really disrupted. And so it makes yeah. a lot of sense. And I love that, you know, as I was thinking about the question, uh, mm -hmm. Self-care is one of the first things that comes to mind. You know, as I've been answering questions and people have had questions mm -hmm. about uh, parenting, they've had questions about how to navigate uh, relational stress. Uh, mm -hmm. the, a common theme and the answer to a lot of those questions is uh, self-care. And it mm -hmm. can seem counterintuitive, you know, that, uh, you know, if I'm dealing with, you know, a difficulty with my kiddo or if I'm dealing with kind of tensions with my spouse, what can I do to improve that? But the person uh, that's showing up in the inner interaction, so you, you know, has, uh, makes all the difference in how the interaction goes. And if you're not in a good space, if you're not taking care of yourself mm -hmm. in a way that allows you to show up as the best version of you, then the situation is set up for failure from the get go. And so rather than not the, whatever the source of the stress, you know, the, one of the key elements to navigating it and navigating it well is knowing how you're wired, how God made you, the necessities of being human, what all of us need mm -hmm. and attending to and caring for those things, which uh, sometimes sounds maybe overly simplistic, right? Sometimes folks go, okay, give me the magic trick, the pill, the words, the recipe, the thing that's mm -hmm. going to kind of like fix it for me. Mm -hmm. And we start talking about your sleep, 
right? They're like, well, okay, but but give me the magic thing that's next. Okay, mm -hmm. so they, like, what are you eating? I'm like, well, okay, but and they keep waiting for bit of that thing, that novel thing that I hadn't thought of. Mm -hmm. And the the novel thing that maybe you haven't thought of is just how important these basics are. Mm -hmm. And if you really do an inventory of what's going on in your life, uh, a lot of folks find that they're not mm. attending to those basic pieces, which means the foundation mm. from which they could do anything else from isn't mm. solid, which then kind of sabotages everything else that you got mm. going on. Do you find that yeah. too, if folks kind of are surprised as there is a part of the answer? Yeah, very much so. And, I, and especially, I think that it can be difficult to wrap our minds around um, why isn't what was working before working now mm -hmm. and that we can feel that and interpret that as like a, like a personal weakness or, um, or feel kind of helpless about that. And that, you know, I think it's really normal that the person who asked this question would be experiencing more anxiety right now. And so I think a big part is giving yourself permission to be a human being with limitations and with needs. And I think a lot of times our, our just natural tendency can be to minimize those or to discount those or to feel guilty for prioritizing those or even read that we have those needs as a sign of personal weakness. So I think just normalizing that. Um, and then, uh, you know, with, with anxiety specifically, you know, I would say um, that the, you know, the two biggest escalators for anxiety, the two things that um, a way to kind of be fuel on the fire of your anxiety is to one, judge yourself for having anxiety. And so that's having a response. Like if you were to think, what is my relationship I have with my anxiety? And if it's one of kind of feeling like judgment and anger that it's here and, um, and, you know, of course it is, um, you know, anxiety is a horrible feeling and you don't want it. And it isn't that, you know, I don't want to experience anxiety. It's been difficult the moments in my life that I have, and we don't want that for you, but of being able to have a mindset of it's here and it's telling an important story about what I'm experiencing. It's telling a story of pain or of difficulty or of stress or of trial or of suffering. And all of that is really important and valid. And so I'm going to, um, I'm going to extend empathy towards myself. Um, and then the second um, way to interact with your anxiety that is sure to escalate it is to resist it. So if you think of like what you resist will persist. And so um, I, you know, of like, oh no, I'm having anxiety, Another you need to stop it. It's another one of those surprising pieces, right? Because we oftentimes I know as I before I learned and understood anxiety more, that's totally what I wanted to do. You know, I would I kind of got really good at kind of blocking out and not thinking about anxiety, distracting myself. And uh, and there's there's lots of different ways to do that, but one of my go-to ways, uh, which on the surface sounds really uh, good because in the right context it can be really good but would be to to look on the bright side mm. right and so yeah yeah and so I'd be like well this is good because you know and I would choose to identify the silver lining or the optimistic positive piece that could come out of this mm -hmm. now on the surface of that that sounds great right and mm -hmm. and true it's really important to have a balanced perspective of things, to be willing to hold the good as well as the bad, and to be able to uh, focus our heart on and, and dwell in the things that are positive and praiseworthy and good. That's biblical, that's healthy, but it it's, becomes detrimental, right, when it's to the, the, the neglect of acknowledging the what's uh, not good in the situation and what doesn't mm. feel good and is rather than investigating and getting curious about those things mm. uh, it becomes this avoidance kind of mechanism mm. that not only didn't help me understand and work through what was going on inside of me but man that same strategy was really invalidating to others around me too 
because when they would bring the hardships and struggles that they were experiencing, that would trigger my anxiety and I would need to kind of shift them away from acknowledging the hard thing that they were going through. Mm -hmm. It just left them feeling like I didn't care about what they were experiencing. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's mm -hmm. uh, so uh, tempting and easy to get into that resistance place rather than following it. I think so. And a lot of times we can feel guilty, right? It's like, oh, I shouldn't feel anxious because of all of these good things, like the mm -hmm. silver lining and the bright side. And so I think, you know, you said being able to hold the good and the bad and of being able to recognize that um, our, we are very complex and being able to do that inside of our own selves of like, I feel grateful, I trust God, and I feel afraid and sad, I'm experiencing grief or doubt, and being able to know that um, feeling happy feelings does not eradicate painful feelings. And, you know, that we can hold both and being able to hold our gratitude and hold the things that are going well can bring comfort and strength so that we can be curious about the things that feel more painful or are hard, but of noticing when we are using gratitude as an avoidance strategy isn't as, isn't helpful to us. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's not intuitive. It's one of those things that uh, oftentimes we can uh, not realize is what we're doing. Oh, sure. I certainly didn't, mm -hmm. you know, and, and only saw the upside of it. Of trying to focus on those things um, mm -hmm. and it's uh, really culturally reinforced mm -hmm. you know, another go-to mine go-to for me has always been kind of pouring myself into work you now that mm -hmm. I uh, feel successful in that realm mm -hmm. feel competent in that realm able to engage and mm -hmm. so it's easy for me to avoid other areas that are more anxiety producing or fear producing mm -hmm. for me because of uncertainty in them or mm -hmm. uh, security that I feel in those areas of my life. And so I can lean into uh, work, which is a really culturally reinforced thing, right? That being yeah. a hard worker and putting in long hours and being a go getter, those things are uh, mm -hmm. valued by employers and they are uh, culturally seen as virtues. And so it's mm -hmm. easy to uh, allow them to, to evolve into a defense that's about avoidance and, and really isn't healthy mm -hmm. or helpful when uh, otherwise they, you know, on the surface can be and in, in, in balance are a good thing. For sure. Yeah, yes, because compartmentalizing can be a healthy defense mechanism so that we can, you know, care for our children and not be over impacted by our anxiety or be able to show up at work or to our life's responsibilities. But what is, you know, what can be the difference between healthy compartmentalization and avoidance is just if we're making space to circle back and to check in with ourselves that our, you know, that anxiety is our body's alarm system saying that something's not right. It's our body trying to do us a favor saying something, there's a threat, I perceive a threat. And so creating space of um, what is that? You know, what is underneath that anxiety that your body um, is reacting to and to make space for that, finding safe places and safe people to be able to feel and explore that and be curious about that, whether that's a friend or a counselor um, is really important um, to be curious around your own heart. Yeah, that's good. I appreciate that, Tish. I'm just mm -hmm. going kind to of think through some of the different anxiety pieces and mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we manage that? Because I mean, lots of folks experiencing anxiety for uh, a variety mm -hmm. of reasons, stressors in their life. One of the stressors, this, this next question that we have mm -hmm. uh, is one that uh, many, many, if not all of us are mm -hmm. kind of having to face. And it really has to do with relationship dynamics, family dynamics, and how do we navigate conflict when uh, we see things differently, feel differently about a uh, subject than others do, right? And the maybe judgment that we can experience and uh, just kind of what that's like for us. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the question says, as the stay at home order ends and things are starting to open up again, how do I navigate differing opinions with family 
about how quickly we should be re-engaging in social interactions and gatherings. That could mm -hmm. cause friction in relationships. Mm -hmm. So we've got uh, families that mm -hmm. things are starting to open up. There's uh, strong opinions about uh, how things should happen. Uh, there's a lot of confusion out there about how to kind of re-engage life. And inevitably, you're going to find yourself in relationship with people you care about and are close to you who see things really different than you. Mm -hmm. and, and this is just one of many, many kind of subjects that could fall into that category. Yeah. Right? Rather it be around parenting with kids, rather it be about work, life, uh, home balance, schooling, uh, faith, mm -hmm. politics. I and mean, there's, there's just many things in which people have strong uh, thoughts around, strong emotional connection with, and strong emotional reaction to uh, yeah. those who, who think differently and feel differently than that. Mm -hmm. And so specifically in this situation, we're talking about uh, COVID-19, uh, re-engaging mm -hmm. states start to open up and activities are going again and, and different mm -hmm. events around that. But it would, mm -hmm. the, the topic is applicable in lots of different scenarios. Yeah. But what initially comes to my mind, you know, is, is a conversation around boundaries, right? Mm. And it's, it's really, if you're not familiar with the concept of boundaries, the idea is that God has created us with a limited autonomy around our life. That is, he's given us responsibility for us and given us a sphere of responsibility, and he's given us choice within that sphere of responsibility. Uh, even, even to an extent that he chooses to respect decisions that we make that are not aligned with the decisions that he wishes that we would make, mm. that he would desire for us. You know, that he's created us with a capacity that nothing else in creation has, or at least that within the, the physical realm has. You know, that, that trees don't have the ability to reject their creator. Wildlife, animals, organisms don't have the ability to reject their creator. But mm. we have been given the ability to mm. reject our creator, which is crazy that we would even yeah. have that capacity. And yet God allows mm. us that ability and capability, mm. that he allows us this limited autonomy around our life where we have choice, that's a reflection of the choice that he has, right? That God has ultimate choice. He can choose to do anything. He's only limited by his own character and the choices mm -hmm. that he makes. And as being people created in his image and likeness, we have choice that's limited. It's not unlimited like his, but that he's given us the responsibility of governing our life and making choices mm -hmm. and that others... Yeah aren't allowed and, and shouldn't be allowed to make those choices for us in our attempts to try to control others and make their choices for them all violate that, that principle of autonomy that God has given us kind of mm -hmm. around our life. Mm -hmm. And so we have to step back and go, you know, what, what's in my yard? Mm -hmm. What has God given me responsibility for? Yeah. And how do I navigate the choices that are part of my life? Mm -hmm. And how do I feel good about those choices before my king and creator that I'm uh, honoring and pleasing him? How do I have the courage to walk those choices out? And then how do I respectfully communicate a, my choices to those that I care about that maybe feel differently, think differently about those choices? Mm. And, and how do I exercise those choices to determine who is in my life? And the, the um, you know, do I, do I make a choice not to have in my life those mm -hmm. individuals who uh, mm -hmm. aren't willing to or aren't able to kind of uh, respect the responsibility and autonomy that God has given me mm -hmm. around my life, extend out to my family and so on. Mm -hmm. Lots of, things that could be said, lots of directions that could be gone around that. But theologically, that's kind of the foundational thought. Curious, Tish, as you're navigating this with, you know, couples, families, 
I mean, we, we, in one form or another, we face this every single day that we're doing therapy. You know, that every week we're helping uh, folks navigate the specifics of these issues. What are some of the common um, kind of thoughts or pieces that you would want to share? One thing that's coming to mind is how when we feel passionate about something, it's really hard not to be in someone else's yard. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, personally, in my own life, things that just, I, and, you know, I think that that's something that different, um, different contexts bring out more or less given based on your personality or based on the personality, personalities in your family, that there's certain things that we're just going to have like really strong convictions about and even have a sense of like justice and, and injustice. And so I think when that is there to just have a lot of self-awareness of, you know, kind of how passionately you're feeling. And if you are feeling compelled to like be in someone else's yard and be like, this is how you should feel. And this is why. And, um, and then also to be able to um, have just in the way that you describe boundaries for our own selves, be able to be mindful of other people's boundaries too. That um, because I feel so passionate about something, I really want to um, like, let me like, like you can have, like your autonomy can have a bench for the day. And I think I would do a better job, you know, in this issue for you today. And I felt that felt that way in my own life with my own loved ones of like, I think I know what's best for you. For sure. <laughs> and I think what you're saying is it's really important to remember that God went to a lot of trouble to preserve our autonomy mm -hmm. and that it's at the basic, um, you know, kind of, dignity that we hold as human beings and that for us to be able to hold that with sacredness within our with our within our own selves that that deserves to be protected and deserves to be cultivated and to notice where it's difficult for, for us to hold our frame in that um, to have awareness around that and then also to be able to recognize that in others that they have the they have the right to be upset about what they're upset about to feel very passionate and form their kind of, you know, ideas of what's right or what's wrong and that I'm not going to put on what they're telling me is right or wrong for me. And I'm not going to try to, you know, tell them to abandon what they're believing and thinking and take on for them what I'm saying is right or wrong for them. And so I think in relationships with loved ones, standing in the tension of we don't agree, but we're both allowed to have our own thoughts, opinions, beliefs, convictions, and passions. And that um, to be able to not feel threatened um, and not feel like we have to emotionally distance, but that we can stand in that tension together, um, even when we feel very differently about something, can be really challenging. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's challenging for me. I think, yes, I mean, me too. I think, I think we all find that really challenging. <laughs> yeah. And how do we relate an intimate relationship with people that, who think differently than us or mm -hmm. believe differently than we do? Uh, and the kind of uh, tension of how do I feel passionate about something but not bowl over others or be disrespectful to others? And how do I live in that tension of uh, loving someone, caring about them, and, uh, and respecting kind of that autonomy that's around their mm -hmm. life? And trusting that God's able to bring conviction and lead into the truth mm -hmm. and that I, I don't need to, and it's not helpful for me to be the the voice of the holy spirit in their life that there there is a holy spirit and i'm not him and that he's able to bring conviction and lead into truth and that um you know uh, respecting his ability to do that is a significant and important piece to us being able to navigate uh relationship uh, with others which really feeds into this next question that uh we've got that's right along the same line, similar concepts, uh, just oriented in a little bit different direction. So the, the question is on relationships still. Uh, it says, as a Christian, how can I best engage with my friends who claim to be believers but aren't walking with the Lord? I'd like to know your biblically informed thoughts on balancing the fact that I'm not the Holy Spirit, but that the scriptures also speak to us in exhorting our brothers and sisters and working towards reconciliation and restoration. 
Yeah, which is a uh, situation that anybody that's trying to walk out a life of faith is facing at one point or another, right? That we all get in that space and have that experience of either loved ones or friends or family that uh, are uh, in a different place than we are in their faith journey. And how do we relate to them and how do we navigate those issues? And there's really kind of two different categories that it seems like uh, this question is speaking to and that um, you know, are commonly facing folks. And one is the, the situation of individuals who are claiming a faith walk and that at Christ as king in their life and, and versus those that were in relationship that aren't, right? And how do we relate to those uh, two groups of people? And in the, in the category of uh, individuals that aren't claiming Christ, that to expect for them to have the convictions and beliefs and, and the, about matters that a Christ follower would isn't really a realistic expectation and isn't really helpful to try to impress those things on folks uh, because that's something that the Holy Spirit really has to regenerate a heart and draw a person into in order for that to be something that they can lay hold of and adopt. But then there's this other category that's you know, like, well, what about friends or family that, that claim to be believers uh, but aren't walking with the Lord or at least the uh, way that they're engaging life uh, doesn't appear to us that they're walking with the Lord or that they are making decisions that in our mind are inconsistent with them walking with the Lord. And what's, what should I do in that dynamic? And it's right in line with the, the tension that's here, right? About autonomy and boundaries and how does that come into play? And uh, where does the kind of uh, personal liberties and the um, freedom that uh, a believer might have versus what another uh, might have convictions around. There's a whole kind of uh, variety of situations where this kind of comes into tension and conflict for folks. But my kind of rule of thumb oftentimes is, is one for uh, our, our life to be one that communicates the gospel and communicates their convictions by the way that we just, the way we do life, the way that we relate to people. And at times that means being responsive to the Holy Spirit, putting a prompting or putting something in our heart, my heart for engaging or talking with someone who uh, by what way they're engaging a situation of life uh, raises concern for me about their spiritual health or their uh, dynamics within their family situation or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's a spirit led thing and it's about being obedient to what the spirit is leading me in. That there's a, a difference between me seeing someone who's not engaging in a way that maybe I think they ought to in a situation versus the Holy Spirit prompting me to speak into a given situation. And whether or not I have the relationship with that person to do so, or that I've been invited to have that voice in their life, is that the kind of dynamic that I have with them? Or is that better coming from someone else that's in their life? So I, I have to be really cautious around navigating, you know, is this something that uh, the Lord would have me engage and speak to? Uh, or is it something that uh, is annoying to me, frustrating to me, violates my um, um, sense of how things should be. And so I feel the desire to uh, speak to that and address that. Whenever I feel the desire to kind of speak to something, that's generally a check for me to step back and check my own motives. Because typically when the Holy Spirit's prompting me, I'm like, ah, I'm more reticent. That versus when I'm feeling frustrated with a situation per se. As you have navigated through this and as you navigate it with clients, what's kind of the maybe word uh, rules of thumb or kind of structure that you offer folks to, as a framework for thinking through scenarios like this? Oh, there's a lot here. 
um, to be considered. But I think something that you're saying is really important, which is being curious about where your own emotions are and where your own reaction is. Because our first responsibility is to have awareness around, is this um, kind of pushing any buttons in us? And what is our motivation and, and our expectation in um, having a kind of exhorting conversation with someone. And so exhorting, um, which this person mentions, is specifically kind of speaking truth and love. It's maybe loving someone enough to say hard things, mm -hmm. loving someone enough to risk them being upset with us um, because we are, um, you know, kind of being very honest with them about something that we, um, are concerned about something that is, um, you know, incongruent that we're noticing they're saying one thing, but they're doing another. Um, and I think going into that space of not like it's our job to write something or to fix something or to get them to change their actions, but of much more like what's going on there. Like, like being curious about that and not maybe assuming that we know what that's about inside of them. And then also helping them be curious. Like, what does that feel like to you? And what is that like for you? And what's happening inside of you? And, you know, and really helping coming alongside of them in the work of conviction that the Holy Spirit always already has in process in their hearts if they are a believer. And so I kind of look at it as I want to support them and love them as they are in their own, you know, relationship with the Trinity and the Holy Spirit is very much working in their life. And it's not my job to, um, you know, to be responsible for um, their conviction of sin, but it is my responsibility if I have that level of trust and if they are open in their life to me, right? So it'd be very like normal for us to have spiritual conversations and there's vulnerability established and trust established in the relationship. If those things are there, then, um, then I think of, um, being able to, um, I, you know, have the boldness to, to even just say, I feel nervous sharing this with you because I don't want to hurt our relationship. And so I'm, I want to go in that, into that conversation very humbly and just say, this is what I'm wondering. I'm, you know, is that, how does that land with you? And being willing to, um, you know, hold that space with a lot of um, humility, flexibility, curiosity. Um, so I don't know if that's helpful, um, but that's kind of what was coming to my mind. Yeah, the, and I think a theme in that that is always significant for me is I just one of humility, right? That, you know, having to walk out uh, those uh, difficult conversations with, um, with a humble heart and uh, with a, a grace that's really uh, mm -hmm. concerned for and cares about the person that's involved. Because uh, if that's not the hard and attitude and context that hard conversations happen, then you're really not engaging in a helpful way or anything that's going to be helpful. Yeah. 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 And I just want to say, I mean, maybe you can think about the person who asked this question, think about a time someone has spoke a hard truth to you and what felt good mm -hmm. and what didn't feel good. And, and if it felt good, um, what were those things and how was it approached and noticing how, when it comes from that place of love, you actually walk away feeling really loved and feeling even more trust for that person, mm -hmm. that it feels good to me to have friends, to know I'm not going to be having this like giant, embarrassing, you know, like, you know, piece of broccoli in my teeth and then not be like, Hey, Tish, <laughs> you know, you know, when you said this, this is kind of what it felt like to me. And that's really like, it feels safe to me to have those friends that will, like they have my blind spots. I need that. We all need that. Totally. So. totally. Yeah. And the relationship there matters a lot, right? Mm -hmm. That there's a dynamic of people that you've invited into your life and that are mm -hmm. you know, speaking to you rather than kind of the stranger off the street or someone that you yeah. really have any relationship with. Uh, yeah. I think there's a, also a recognition of people being at different places in their journey with the Lord. Mm. Uh, one of the things that I uh, 
in my walking through these things and and talking with the Lord about these things recognizes, you know, if, if the Holy Spirit highlighted to me at any point in my life, every way in which I am uh, falling short of the glory of God at the same time, I'd probably just burst into flames. <laughs> I can just spontaneously combust. You know, I think yes. of Isaiah being in the throne throne room of God and being like, "Woe is me!" And that yes, you know, I'm, I'm undone. Not, I'm an unclean man. How can I be in the presence of of a holy God and and live? Yeah. Right. That there's uh, in the gentleness and the kindness of our King and Creator. Uh, he's at working on different things in me at different times, different seasons of life where he's working with me around this. And not because there aren't other things that I need to grow in also, but this is what he's working on and growing me in. And I may not even be aware of these other areas, or maybe I am, but then in another season, he's working on this, in another season. And if he was working on all of those pieces at the same time, it would be my undoing. Just be so overwhelming that but that's not how he operates within my life i just have to realize that it, he the kindness and gentleness and how he works in my life is is not dissimilar to how he does so in other people's lives mm-hmm. that there's a patience of him uh kind of working with them at the place in the journey that they're in which is looks different maybe than where i'm at and different yeah. than it will look for them five years, 10 years down the road in their faith walk journey. Yes. Yeah. The last thing I would say really quick on that is I think if we are able to be in the space of accepting God's grace towards us, remembering that it's his kindness that leads me to repentance. If I'm having a hard time being in that space with God and myself, then that is most important before I get into that space with someone else. And so I would say, you know, to, um, yeah, to make sure that in your own heart and mind that you are able to, to be in that um, ex- accepting grace for yourself, um, because that's going to help you be in that place in your heart with mm-hmm. that person. Because really we're saying when we're in those conversations, we're saying, look, it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. Like he loves us and he has compassion and he's patient and he's understanding. And so in love, we're like, we're like, come in and you know, be in the safety of grace with me. Mm -hmm. And so if we're having a hard time, if we struggle with feeling shame or judgment or struggle with that in our own hearts, then that's probably the first place to start. Yes. And, and man, to take the pressure off yourself that, right. Mm -hmm. That, uh, the, the God knows exactly where you're at and he knows where he's taking you and he knows how to get you there. That the Holy spirit is at work to draw you along that journey and to develop that in you and to lead you into that truth and that you can trust him to do so that you don't have to feel like the weight and the pressure is on you to figure all this out. And then if you don't figure it out, then you'll be a, a big disappointment to come. But instead that he's taken the responsibility of sanctifying you and growing you and healing you and maturing you into his own hands and said, I will redeem you and I will bring about this, Uh, sanctification and you'll be holy because I will make you holy in that process and to allow allow that weight to be on his shoulders and really all you have to do is trust him in that and be obedient as he leads you down that path Mm -hmm. Tish I've had a blast uh, and uh, answering these questions thank you everybody that's tuned in and for your questions, if you have questions that you thought of in the course of this, uh, you can uh, tweet them in to uh, my counselor online. You can use the asking for a friend form on the website at my counselor online forward slash ask. Uh, you can email it. You can message it to us. There's a variety of different ways you can communicate it. And they'll all get to uh, us so that we can speak through those things next time. Until then, know that we're cheering you on and want you to be blessed, and, uh, and we love you. Thanks for joining.